life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Marshall. I'm Lainey. And today we are going to be talking about The Walking Dead Season 2, Episode 5, Chupacabra. Mmm, Chupacabra. (laughs) This week we do not have Corey with us because he is out in California, or he will be out in California uh, when this episode drops, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, because we record several weeks ahead of launch, uh, we have to maneuver our schedule around quite a bit. So Corey is not going to be here for this podcast episode. But that's okay. We still have a lot to talk about in this episode. And he and I already had a conversation, so I know what he means when he has his note. Let's talk about this episode in particular, which originally aired on AMC in the United States on November 13th, 2011. It was directed by Guy Furland and written by David Leslie Johnson. Upon its initial broadcast on November 13th, Chupacabra was watched by an estimated 6.12 million viewers, slightly down from the previous episode. So it is kind of losing steam a little bit, which is weird. Uh, I do believe it does pick back up, though, in the middle of the season because of things that happen. So we'll, we'll track that as it goes. We start this episode on the highway. And this is a flashback portion, and it's actually one that I did not remember happened at all. Me either. So we see a highway. It's backed up with congestion. The, everyone is gridlocked. Shane is tuning a radio, and Lori is sitting on the hood. Sophia and Carl are playing checkers, again, because they were playing checkers in the... Uh, in, in the rec room. In the rec room of the... Of the it's their game. What is what was they, it, the it, CDC? Yeah, mm-hmm. the CDC. And they hear a helicopter go by. They're actually sitting in the back of the Jeep Cherokee. Uh, Ed is there on the side and he's smoking. And Carol is kind of hanging out, just looking at what's going on. It feels like this is where they met. Yeah, they they met in this gridlock on the way to Atlanta. Uh, Carol offers the kids some MREs, and Ed just shuts it down. And he says, "Is the this is operational security. I, I don't think this guy is ex-military at all. He doesn't have any kind of awareness of his surroundings. He doesn't have any capability of fighting. He just abuses people. I think this guy's one of those armchair preppers. Like, he's seen some stuff on the internet about how to prep for right. you know, things going down. And he's he bought everything he needs. But he doesn't know how to use it. And we see how Carol reacts to him like... Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. And then she she goes around to the other side of the car. Lori overhears what happens and kind of is like, oh, it's that kind of situation. Yeah. But then Carol finds some, like, it looks like crackers or something in her purse and gives those to Carl instead. So even yeah, though... it's just like a, a, a sleeve of saltines. Yeah. So like. even though, yes, her husband did shut her down, she's trying to do everything she can for them, which is... Great. I mean, it's very indicative of how Carol is at that point. Shane and Lori go scout up ahead. They hear an explosion and then a fight randomly breaks out. I don't know why. There are fighter jets overhead. It looks like it was dark. I could No, really those see are those. actually more helicopters. More helicopters, okay. Yeah, those are I believe Apache helicopters. So they go into the forest where there are some more people from the highway down there. Because they can kind of see into the buildings up above in Atlanta. And all of a sudden, they just see it being bombed. Mm -hmm. And the helicopters are dropping bombs on Atlanta. And you can also see uh, anti-tank rounds. You can actually see the tank that we have been seeing this entire time. You can see it firing from the streets up Mm. into buildings. Wow. Um. I just have this really weird theory. The military we have seen, they went in and they started shooting the living in the hospital, not shooting the dead. 
They were shooting just the living. Mm -hmm. And now you see these helicopters coming in and bombing and unleashing tanks and unleashing anti-tank rounds randomly in the streets after cutting the broadcast about the shelters that were in the city. What is the possibility that that broadcast was just trying to lure people into the city so that they could bomb them? We are seeing this over and over again. The military is killing civilians. Now, the other thing that I want to bring up is we didn't get to see any icons on these helicopters. What if they weren't our military? Correct. We don't know. They could have been the Republic military of uh, beyond, uh, from the world beyond. Right. And I, I am very excited to start watching that show when I can get my hands on it. But right now I cannot watch World Beyond because it is not available the way that we watch TV. Yeah. We're going to have to wait a little bit. I don't know. It's a very interesting theory. <laughs> At the farm, Lori wakes up in the tent and gets her boots on. She says good morning to Dale, but it, it's very clear that she kind of woke up a little later than she meant to. There is a really cute little fireside setup at this camp with so there's some chairs. There's a lantern. There's a fire pit. Um, I actually really like the romantic nature of camping, being able to be in a tent and just kind of rough it. Um, I used to, both of us used to travel with our grandparents in an RV mm -hmm. to some, you know, camping areas, you know, good Sam clubs and whatnot. And I always remember how it was so much fun. I loved finding like a creek or something to play in or just whatever the camping grounds had to offer, exploring that. It was always so much fun. And I think looking at this situation, I also think it's just very sweet and romanticized. I have some really great memories of that RV. I also have one really bad memory of that RV. Yes, I know you do. <laughs> For those of you who've seen pictures of me, you'll see a gigantic scar on my forehead. Um, that is from that RV. Um, but one of us survived that encounter, and the other one didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> he didn't get hit he actually fell just in case you were wondering <laughs> i hit it <laughs> <laughs> it's laundry day see you there under things tumbling thank you comment if you know what that is about <laughs> you know here i am asking like we're actually in a place where you can comment if you're listening to this on youtube you can comment yeah if you're not then you can't okay uh <laughs> Carol let Lori sleep in, but Lori said she would prefer to help with all the work because getting zombie blood out of clothes takes extra time. You know, actually, there is a way to get blood out of cloth. The, there is one thing that is available to everybody that breaks down blood very quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. Saliva. Mm -hmm. Seems a lot of people to spit. Oh, actually, you have to suck on it, Ew. which gets a little weird. Lori uh, is starting to help carol hang clothes and i've noticed clothes from past episodes so Lori is hanging andrea's striped shirt that she wore a couple episodes back carol is hanging one of dale's shirts like his hawaiian type shirts glenn's shirt with the 23 on his sleeve is also there and someone has plaid boxers i'm not sure who those belong to but oh hey look hanging. here's another grenade i'll keep that <laughs> carol talks about making dinner for herschel's family as a thank you and then she also says that Lori is the unofficial first lady, and she is not happy with that idea, apparently. She's like, do I want to be? I mean, she's not very comfortable with that, even though that's kind of what she's always maneuvered herself to be. The group is preparing for so to search for Sophia more using the grid system. They all have what, like long weapons for hitting the walkers this time, yay preparation. And then some of them have blue cloths and some of them have red cloths. So they're going to use that to flag in the grid. To where they've been. Where yeah. they've been. Beth's boyfriend, Jimmy, wants to help with the search. So Jimmy is there like really randomly. Um, we see him less than Beth and we don't even see Beth that much. Um, but Jimmy wants to help with the search. And Daryl shares his theory that whoever slept in the cupboard had to have been small. And this what he's talking about is the house in the previous episode in the pantry, he found some bedding items inside, but it was a very small space. So it had to have been a small child. And so he thinks that is where Sophia either was or is. And Shane basically says that's a stupid theory. He, yeah. He, he, th he thinks there's you know, no it's, merit. It, it's totally logical. So of course I hate it. Of course. 
Daryl wants to borrow a horse and scout things from above on the cliffs down into the creek. And they have this whole conversation about uh, how Daryl saw a chupacabra when he went squirrel hunting. Uh, then he, he, uh, people are like, oh, you didn't see one or whatever. He's like, no, no, I saw one. And then uh, what I saw that was kind of funny in this moment is that Daryl is smart and he actually knows about history. He knows about culture uh, because he knew about the Trail of Tears. Yeah. He, uh, from the last episode, he knows about the Chupacabra. That is a South American lore, uh, you know, of the Hispanic culture. And, you know, it's very easy to believe in the Chupacabra when the walkers exist in your world. You know, that they're all kind of these magical fantasy creatures. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know what the Chupacabra is... It's this mythical creature that attacks livestock. Its name means goat sucker, which sounds like an insult to me. You should start using that more often. You goat sucker. Um, But none of the descriptions I've heard um, resemble a dog. And that's one thing that Rick says. He's like, what, you believe in a a vampire dog? What? I've never seen any descriptions that look like a dog. But uh, when I was in college, I actually did a Blair Witch style video for our Spanish class that was about the Chupacabra. That's funny. And we were being chased by the Chupacabra in the woods that was actually the school's arboretum. So Jimmy grabs for the gun and everyone's like, no, no, no. Do you have any experience with the gun? And he's like, no, but I want it. You know, I want to defend myself. And I think Daryl says something like, yeah, and people in hell want Slurpees. Obviously. Yeah. (laughs) So then Shane invites him to come to gun training and says he's a certified instructor. Good. Yes. I think that's probably the one good thing he can bring to this team is being a gun instructor. Correct. Glenn is on the porch playing the guitar that Dale had found on the highway when he had done his sweep of everything. He reminds Maggie how many condoms they have left. Eleven. Eleven. (laughs) She responds almost like it was a waste of time. But at the same time, like, when she first walks in, she has this smile on her face that says she's really happy to see him and she wants to talk to him about something. But then she's playing it off when he says that, yeah, we've got a lot of time. And Glenn tries to act really confident because, of course, when they were in the drugstore, she said something like, you know, what, are you that confident? And so then he's, like, trying to act confident. He's like, yeah, because I'm really the only person that you have around here to do this with, right? Yeah, but I I like this thing about her character. She doesn't like confident Glenn. She likes vulnerable Glenn. Glenn that isn't sure that she can rile up. Probably because, you know, being the farmer's daughter, a rather attractive woman in this area... She's dealt with a lot of guys who are sexually confident. That too. But I think the other problem is that confident Glenn is fake Glenn. And she doesn't like fake Glenn. That's very true. In the forest, Shane and Rick are doing their part of the grid looking for Sophia. And they're hanging up some red cloths. They have this whole conversation that just really kind of irks me. But the first point I want to make about this is I wonder why these two decided to pair up together in the first yeah. place. So they have, at least we know that Andrea and T-Dog made one group. Why did the two of those go off together? Why didn't Shane go off with Andrea and Rick with T-Dog? Like, that just makes a lot more sense to me. Because, than... you know, Andrea can't really fully use a gun yet. Right. And T-Dog is injured. So exactly. you should have somebody who can defend and one person has a second set of eyes. I feel like this was kind of a writer's error. I think they wanted to put these two together so they could further move this plot point, this conversation in a way while they accomplish something. But I just don't think logically it makes sense to me. Yeah. Rick tries to start this conversation about this waitress at the DQ named Marianne and... Uh, I think it's because they were in silence before and he wanted to start talking with him. At that point, Shane calls himself an artist and protege, but he means prodigy. (laughs) Uh, Again, this is a very extremely derogatory towards women. Like they are objects to create art with, you know, Yeah. because he's an artist. Like, really? 
This isn't a mutual thing. You're doing something to her and it's art, okay? Right. I, I, you know, if he's a prodigy, I think it's more in the terms of the old uh, internet service provider. Outdated and useless. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rick admits that he lied about sex with Sheila because he didn't know the bases. So they're talking about, did you go to first base, second base? And he said that he went to home base, but he didn't know what the bases were. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, this conversation is lame. <laughs> By the way, I don't really understand why they felt the need to put. I this feel like they in probably here. could have done like an immediate rest. They could have like started at the later portion of this conversation, mm-hmm. and we would have gotten the idea of what was going. They've on. They've already kind of had this conversation. I just don't understand why yeah. it was needed. Yeah, and again. They tried to pair these two up in an illogical way, and now they're having a kind of a lame conversation. Yeah. Uh, but Shane thinks the search is a waste of time because Sophia is probably dead. And Rick feels guilt about the fact that he left her, so he feels like he needs to search for her. But at the same time, the way that Shane is just is he very cold, very calculated. He's like, you have 72 hours to find, and then you're looking for a body. And the way that Rick looks at him with all this disgust... Uh, one thing that Corey was saying is that when you feel disgust, it's like a litmus test for someone else's morals. Mm. You can, you, when you start feeling that, you know that there's something wrong between the way you two see the world. Uh, the other thing is that um, this highlights the the apocalypse as kind of like a crucible. It, it refines down the identity of the survivors mm. to really show who they are and what they value. Um, so you can find who's the really good people because they'll they'll rise to the top. Right. Daryl is riding the horse in the woods and he finds Sophia's doll. But this was the doll, again, that was given to her by uh, the daughter in the Morales family before mm-hmm. they left to go on their own. Uh, this is the doll that she was holding when she ran into the woods and Rick hid her. So he finds the doll in the creek. So this doesn't bode well, really, uh, for Sophia. Or it does, because it proves he's on the right track. And in an earlier episode, they he's like, yeah, I'll go out on my own. I'm better on my own. Well, he has found two very important clues on, himself, on his own. Mm-hmm. Every time he's been with somebody else, he's found nothing. Mm-hmm. It's very true. Yeah. Uh, he starts to do the tracking again. He's on the horse, but birds kind of make the horse nervous a little bit. Um, and then we see there's a snake and that scares the horse further. And Daryl rolls down this rock embankment waterfall and falls into the creek. He has a head injury and somehow an arrow got stuck in his side. Yeah. And then rather than just like rip it out, like some people would think you'd want to do, he actually tie- rips off his sleeves and uses that to tie it in place, to hold it in place, so he doesn't bleed out. Mm-hmm. But also, this sleeveless look that he's now sporting, like, it's totally iconic for his character. It's like that and his jacket. Mm-hmm. Those are the two things everybody remembers about his look. Got to show off his guns. Yeah, I got, I got the zombie killing guns, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a long way back up to the top of the hill, and he see, he hears rustling in the creek across the way. Um, like in the bushes, so but he is going to attempt to get up the hill. Not the one there the rocks were, but the other part of the hill, so he can climb up that part. We return to the farm, and Glenn lets Lori know that he knows that she is pregnant. Or at least he assumes that she is, because she got the test. But now he can finally confront her about it. And she's like, you know, don't tell anybody. And he realizes that Rick doesn't even know yet. Mm-hmm. Rick and Shane return, and Shane wants to call off the search again. Why couldn't they have had this part of the conversation? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of out in the woods. Uh, Rick talks it over with Lori, and he says, well, is searching making us weaker? Uh, you know, that we're spending all of our resources in, in trying to find her? Is it making us weaker? Yeah, because, like, Shane is kind of putting doubt in his head. But then Lori, out of, like... Something I've not really seen her do that much. Mm -hmm. She comes in and she supports him. And she's really going in there and, no, you're doing the right thing. This And she says something that's really important to say. This is harder to do. This is the hard choice rather than cutting bait and running. Mm -hmm. And then Beth comes over and says to Rick that Herschel wants a word with him. Being called on the principal's office. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. 
In the forest, Daryl is still trying to make it up the hill. He makes it halfway and then falls back down. And things kind of get worse as far as his injuries go. I'm a little thinking, bit. yeah. A little bit. Yeah. After that tiny scene, we go back to the farm and Rick talks to Herschel. Herschel says one of his horses is missing, which we now understand that Daryl never asked if he could borrow a horse. He just just like, I'm going to borrow a horse. Yeah. So that's a bad thing. And then apparently Jimmy didn't ask Herschel and have the conversation he said he had with Herschel at all, saying that Herschel said to clear it with Rick that he could go out, yeah. which is not really on this group's... It's more on Jimmy than anything else. And that's why Rick is like, okay, so you and I, we need to work on our communication. We got to figure out a way to make sure that, you know, we're all communicating properly. And Herschel shuts it down almost by saying, well, why don't you control your people and I control my people? Well, then he needs to control Jimmy because exactly. that's his people. Yeah. I think he's saying the same thing. He's just being really kind of a, a jerk about it. After that tiny scene, we are back in the forest and Daryl is unconscious. He starts to see things. He thinks he sees Merle alive. Now, before we jump into the rest of the scene, I want to talk about the return of Michael Rooker. Apparently, at this point, they had realized that the character of Merle was a fan favorite, even though he was only in like two episodes, maybe? I think when he started doing all that survival stuff of cauterizing his own wound and vanishing and actually stealing the truck, mm -hmm. people were like, wow, this guy could be a really cool villain. Yeah. He's really hardy. So they brought him back. Uh, some other things you uh, may have seen him in, since we didn't really talk about him before, was uh, he is actually going to be in the new Fast and Furious 9 movie. He was in Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2. Um, he He's the one who has kind of like the ability to summon an arrow with like a whistle and make it do what he wants it to do. Yondu is Yondu, the name of the yeah. character. Yondu, I believe he's called Yondu the Whistler or Yondu the Archer, mm -hmm. one of those two. Very different in the comics, but I like the MCU version mm -hmm. of it. He was also in the movie Mall Rats, where he has a stinky hand and he eats the pretzels and it's very disgusting. <laughs> and um, also, just for those of you who, who know, Burn, Burn Notice and Psych are like two of our favorite shows. Mm. And he has been in an episode of both of those. So we thought that was also interesting. That He's playing different characters. Different though. characters, definitely. Yeah. So Merle is talking to Daryl and tells him to take the arrow out. It's kind of goading him. Um, the interesting thing is that we see that Merle actually has both his hands in this scene as well. And it actually focuses on that fact mm -hmm. as Daryl is focusing on that fact. And he's coming to the realization Merle is not actually here. Right. There are some continuity errors in this part of the episode, though, because if you're watching and, I, and you can't help but watch daryl's face because it's all you see a lot of times very up close sometimes he has mud on his lips and sometimes he doesn't mm -hmm. but i did notice that towards the end of this part of the scene there is a spot where merle kind of grabs daryl's face a little bit and i wonder if that's where he accidentally cleared off the mud and they didn't really realize it until mm. later and they were doing reshots of the scene again without the mud on there so you can look for that. That's fun. So Daryl is having an internal argument about who his family really is. Is it Merle or is it these new people that he has found? And uh, one of the things that Merle is saying here is, ain't nobody ever cared about you but me. And this is an interesting little thing that you also see him doing as Yondu mm. in Guardians of the Galaxy. Both of them are sitting there saying... Uh, nobody's cared about you. No one's protected you but me. You need to do what I tell you to do. But really, both of them presented these abusive, uh, harsh environments for these people to grow up in. And that does kind of lead them to being hardier. But we'll come ahead and talk about that later. Daryl wakes up to find a walker nibbling on his toes. Uh, he has steel-toed boots, y'all. Yeah. If you didn't expect that walker... Well, maybe he just likes the taste of leather. Maybe he has a foot fetish. Maybe, but the fact that he has steel-toed boots saves his toes. Yes. Um, and that's just what I'm assuming, is that his boots are steel-toed, but they're pretty hefty, so they mm. might be. 
Uh, he fights the walker and another is starting to come along. So he pulls the arrow out of his side and shoots the other walker with it. You know what just occurred to me? He also has a side injury. Yeah. He's part of the club. He's part of the club, Daryl. Only it's not on the right side. It's on the left side. Right. Exactly. Well, that's the left side is where Rick's was. Gerald wakes up, well, after he, like, shoots the walker with his arrow, he kind of goes unconscious again. So he wakes up, and that's the point where he starts to cut the ears off the walker and make a necklace. So the first thing I want to say about this is we used to actually have this necklace in soap. I don't know, I think we had to get rid of it because the soap started to, to look a little funky, but uh, we did get it from Loot Crate, <laughs> which... I thought it was hysterical. Yeah, it was funny. But my second question is, why now? Why is he getting trophies of the walkers now? It's a really good question. Because uh, everybody else seems to notice, well, what are these when they see it? Mm-hmm. They're like, why is he doing this? This is weird. Um, it may be something along the lines of trophies of surviving. That he's like, I'm here. Right. So this is proof that I'm doing it. I don't know. He hears Merle say, please don't feed the birds. Tuppence a bag? Oh, sure. Uh, And then you also kind of maybe think that Daryl was on mushrooms when he saw the chupacabra the first time. Yeah, because now he's starting to have this conversation with Merle as Merle's up at the top and is just kind of teasing him and telling him that he's too much of a pansy Mm. and that he can't do any of this stuff. Right. Um, So Merle is like... The subconscious fight that Daryl has within himself to prove everyone wrong. That what they think about him in these racial, not racial stereotypes, but, you know, the the cultural stereotypes of being a, a southern redneck, he likes to prove all that wrong. He's not stupid. He's capable. He's smart. He is sensitive when he has to be. And those are all things that I think he internally he's fighting with himself here in the form of moral. And also, at the same time, Merle's abuse in his past is what's giving him this willpower to go on as he's like, one of the things that Merle is saying is, "Uh, you're going to, or what? What are you going to do to me? Mm -hmm. And that is what's giving him the the drive to be like, no, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to make you shut up. Mm -hmm. And when he gets up to the top, the last thing that he hears Merle say is, Grab your friend Rick's hand. Because you can't grab Merle's anymore. Because he doesn't have one. And he's also not there. And he's also not there. (laughs) But this this was subconscious Merle's last words. It was going back to the previous episode where the last encounter that Rick had with him was, you don't have to do this on your own. Mm -hmm. So Daryl is now finally accepting he has to trust Rick and the rest of the group. Yeah, it's such a such a good conclusion that he realizes this. At the farm, Herschel comes in to see Lori, Carol, Beth, and Patricia making dinner. Uh, they do talk about potatoes in this episode, and I want to make a point there because of when they do the dinner scene later, we're going to talk about what they're actually eating. But uh, Herschel gets really uptight about having clear boundaries and not accepting things in this way and that they shouldn't be in there cooking and whatever to Maggie. And then he starts getting uptight to Maggie about Glenn and how everything is temporary and she shouldn't be like connecting herself to him and all this stuff. To me, he's just kind of sounding like a nervous whiny man. <laughs> you know? It's very nervous and patriarchal. Yes. It's very much, this is, this is not going to work you need to give me my space and my house. And I, I use that, that, yeah, it just feels like he's trying to hold on mm. to the way things were before these people came in. Correct. Yeah. At the RV camp, Andrea is on top of the RV with the rival doing lookout, but she hasn't had training yet. And uh, I think she thinks this is her loophole. She can get to use the gun if she's a lookout. But she forgot the fact that they only said that Dale could use the gun when he's a lookout, not Andrea. Yeah. Glenn is inside the RV returning Dale's book. I noticed that the dishes are in exactly the same spot they were in in the last episode when Daryl comes in to give the rose, the Cherokee rose, to Carol. They're they're stacked up. Mm-hmm. Which 
I guess means that that's the way they're always stacked up because in between that time they've had dinner in that RV. Because remember when Lori went yeah. by in the end of the last episode, they were in there eating dinner. I can't see the title of the book that Glenn has, but Dale says he would have brought better books if he knew the world was ending. So let's have a discussion. What book would you bring to the apocalypse if you knew the world was ending? Um, so the book I would probably bring with me. Um, and this is not like one of those things where you go, well, I want to bring this medical book or this survival. Yeah. No, I'm talking about guilty pleasure reading. What are you bringing? Hmm, that's a really good question. And I had started thinking about it b before, but then I was like, ooh, hey, you know what's really great about having a cell phone in the apocalypse? You can load it up with all sorts of books and never run out. Except hmm. when the power dies. So you have to solar panel that thing. Yes. Um, so first off, I would want to have a really big book, something that I can read over and over and still have tons of room and take me a while. I'm starting to feel like <clears throat> House of Leaves might not be a bad one, but it's also so dense. Um, you know, you might actually start to understand it after a few years in the apocalypse. Mm, sure. Um, what about you? What would you choose? Well, that I think because we're talking about guilty pleasures, if it's a book that I would want to read over and over and over again and not get tired of it, um, I would either bring um, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo or I would bring, um, like, just Harry Potter book seven <laughs> or something mm. like that. Something that I can read so many times. It's definitely, you know, I'm not saying you can't bring other books. I'm just saying, what's the number one book on your list? Wow. I can't even think of it right now. You don't have a favorite book? Oh, I have favorite books, but, like, which one would I, which one is my guilty favorite? Like... I might bring one of the Dresden Files. Oh. I really love those books. Cold Days. Okay. Either Cold Days or Changes. Interesting. Because right. they're just, they're really emotionally deep. And a good mystery. And lots of action. In this conversation, Glenn kind of shows not only his age, but his inexperience with being around women. <laughs> He wants to know if Andrea is on her period because not only is she acting weird, but all the women are acting weird. And are their cycles sinking? Because maybe that's what's happening right now. And Dale's like, let me stop you right there. <laughs> First off, it. never say those words again. <laughs> and then, Gail, then um, Glenn is like, all right, let me just spill all the beans about everything that's happening. Like, Lori is... Possibly, possibly pregnant. pregnant and you know they had sex with Maggie and la yada, yada I think if you were going to be dead tomorrow wouldn't you take that opportunity that was given to Glenn I, I would say that it depends now if we're talking about Maggie Green and especially the woman that she becomes later on yeah she's worth it mm -hmm. that's a woman right there right um, some other people maybe not Right. But I think when Glenn says this, you know, I thought I was going to die tomorrow. That's why I did this. That's what he was thinking. I think logically it makes sense to me. You know, what What are the things on your bucket list? Well, maybe he It's just like, look, I, this might be my last chance. Let's do this type thing. I understand that mentality. What's number one on your bucket list? I want to go to Europe. I would like to go specifically to ireland yes exactly so andrea's on top of the rv and she thinks she sees a walker coming out of the forest and she's like i'm gonna shoot it i'm gonna do it like i'm gonna prove myself by shooting this rifle and we can see that it's clearly daryl but he does look like a walker he's lurching yeah, he is he's very covered bloody. in blood and he's wearing walker ears from his neck uh so everyone wants to go after the walker but they start running towards the walker to be closer. But Andrea's super gun happy. And she's like, I'm going to do this. Let's do this now. And so she gets in the place where she can shoot from a lay down position. It's prone, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Andrea shoots it, grazes him on the side of the head. She's very proud. She's like, 
Look what I did. They're all going to be proud of me now. And everybody is screaming, no! And she's like, yeah. wait, what? And they, they managed to get him, they pick him up, and he's like, man, I was kidding. Because there was a, there was a, oh no, because before she fires the rifle, mm-hmm. okay, so everybody's running up, and they think that he's a walker, and Rick pulls his gun on Daryl, thinking that it's Walker Daryl now. Mm-hmm. And Daryl goes, man, that's the third time you pointed that gun at my head. You're going to shoot it? And then Andrea shoots. Exactly. And a- after, you know, she's feeling really happy. They pick him up and he goes, man, I was kidding. Right. <laughs> so there now he has a second he- head injury. He has now been... Cracked open on one side from falling down the hill and then shot on the other side. Rick removes the ears from Daryl's neck and like pockets them like nobody needs to know about this right now. And then T-Dog is like, look, guys, th- it's it's Sophia's doll. Yes, yeah, Sophia's doll. And they don't really know what to think about yeah. that. <laughs> we return to the farm and Herschel is patching up Daryl. And he goes, it's a wonder you people have survived this long. Well, you know, Herschel, you don't go anywhere, so... <laughs> mm, true. Shane continues to voice his negative opinion about looking for Sophia. We get it, Shane. Shut up. Lori says the tough call isn't cutting and running. It's staying and helping. And I love this because it is more of a risk to open yourself up to people and stay and help people than it is to cut and run. And when we look back at the very beginning of this episode, we find another person who is doing exactly what Shane is doing. Mm -hmm. Ed, who is hoarding for himself all these MREs, all this food, and is deciding that he's just going to take care of himself and his family. Mm -hmm. And that's what Shane is wanting to do. And it's the wrong call because anything that Ed wants to do is a bad idea. Right. She also says that she and Carl are no longer his, uh, Shane's pro- problem or excuse anymore. Andrea is on the steps crying about shooting Daryl. <laughs> is this a wake-up call for her? Uh, is this what she needs t- to stop being so gun-happy because she could have killed Daryl? Yeah. She's finally realizing, oh, I've got I to gotta be responsible with this thing. Oh, I didn't think about that before. And Dale comes up and he's like, no, don't worry. We've all wanted to shoot him every once in a while. <laughs> Maybe not as much as they wanted to shoot Merle, but yes. Yes. On the farm, Lori is with Carl, and she's in the room kind of contemplating the baby decision. Does she keep the baby? Does she not keep the baby? Who does she tell about the baby? Yeah. Uh, she really needs to be talking to Rick, as it's not totally her decision, really. But I think... She doesn't because she doesn't know who the daddy is. Mm -hmm. So she can't really talk about this with Rick. But quite honestly, DNA tests are not existing right now. So who really cares? Yeah. And you know they had sex as soon as he showed back up. Correct. So at this point, just choose. Exactly. And I think she has. Mm -hmm. It's time for dinner. So Jimmy, Beth, Maggie, and Glenn are sitting at the kids' table, which I thought was so funny. All the young lovers. (laughs) Uh, In the corner, there looks to be a stack of Bell canning jars wrapped in plastic. There's like three uh, stacks of them, Mm -hmm. which I thought is kind of cool because uh, we have been watching Edwardian Farm, and we actually just saw this one episode where uh, where they picked a bunch of cherries, and they were doing the preservation of them in jars. And I always forget that that's one of the things you need to do when you don't have things year round is to can things. So having these jars was actually very smart. Probably they had it before the apocalypse happened, but they've got a stock of jars. They're ready to go for but preserving I, I don't know, like, what actual crop do they produce on this farm? Well, they don't, but that doesn't mean that they can't, like, get things and preserve things. Yeah. Um, maybe it's for all the milk from the cows? I don't, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Dinner seems to be ham, green beans, corn, chocolate cake, 
and some kind of light brown thing. I think is mashed potatoes because they talk about the fact that they have potatoes and it's been so long since they've had a potato when they were making dinner earlier in the kitchen. There's also a light pink juice. It looks to be like a Kool-Aid or a Crystal Light type of drink, like that color. Or grapefruit juice, maybe? Ma oh, no, it was a little too pink to be grapefruit juice. Okay. No one is talking. Everybody is silent and just eating until Glenn asks if anyone knows guitar. And they say, well, Otis did, which is sad. Yeah. And then there's Shane again, brooding. Mm. <laughs> I just... I just want to know what's going on in his head every time someone mentions Otis and he's like, pulls that face. I don't know if it's guilt. I think it's something else, but I can't figure out what that face is about. Yeah, it's just tension of, are they going to figure it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, also guilt. Com you combine those things together and it just makes for bad face. Mm. Over at the kids' table, Maggie is passing Glenn a note. Now, I laughed about this because in the previous scene, when Herschel's yelling at her about Glenn, she says, I understand I'm not in high school anymore. But here she is passing a note like she's in high school again. Um, and it says, tonight, where? That's where the what the note says. Herschel notices that they are passing a note. And that, yes, Glenn is writing something. We don't see you what just yet. Right. Carol brings Daryl some dinner and she gives him a little head kiss. It was so cute. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like it was on the side where Andrea shot him. <laughs> she says that he has done more for Sophia than Ed ever did. And that he is every bit as good as Rick or Shane. She actually says you did more for him for her today. Yes. Wow. Yes. And in the way that he made knew what to do to make her feel better about Sophia in the previous episode, she knew what to do to make him feel like what he did wasn't nothing. Yeah, like he didn't just waste his time playing around in the creek. No, mm -hmm. you actually did something. What you're doing matters. You're a part of us. Maggie opens the note. And sees that they should meet in the hayloft. And she freaks out because she knows what's in the barn. Mm -hmm. So she starts running. So we're in the barn. Glenn is kind of going down the hill with a blanket and a flashlight. And it's locked. But he sees that there's a ladder to get up into the top hayloft. And then you see Maggie running out the door. So he gets up into the hayloft and he, he smells something weird. Don't know why he didn't hear something weird. I mean, they're not quiet. Yeah, they're not. Um, so then he notices that there are walkers in there. I did look and I could not see Sophia. You I didn't see in her. In the shot, either. you cannot see her. But there's also a lot of overhangs mm -hmm. uh, from the loft. So she may have been underneath one of those. Mm -hmm. Given when she arrives, um, we know that she was deep in there. Right, and so that was a major spoiler for all of you guys who have not watched this, the other episode and know that she does come out, but we told you there were spoilers in these. So, sorry guys. Sophia's Sophia in the bar. dead. I remember watching this episode for the first time and being so shocked at what he found because I can see things coming pretty plainly when it comes to mysteries, but this, I did not see coming that they were going to have walkers that lived on the property yeah like what are you thinking um maggie says to glenn well you weren't supposed to see this very ominously like almost to the point where you think oh is maggie gonna kill him yeah when i first <laughs> saw this episode i thought she was gonna shove him in oh yeah and this really gives you this feeling like what are they doing with these walkers is there something really dark about this and we're going to find out what their actual intent with all of these walkers are in a later episode. That's correct. So in this episode, we don't have anyone who is shot and killed. We thought we might have a Daryl, but we didn't. Thank goodness, because if Daryl dies, we riot. Uh, the title, though, we'll talk about what Chupacabra means. And we kind of talked about that a little bit more about what the Chupacabra legend is that Daryl thought he saw it when he was high on shrooms squirrel hunting. Um, and he thinks he may see it again. And is, in fact, Merle his chupacabra. Mm -hmm. Merle is this imaginary creature that 
drives you forward into this world of the mythical. There are no comic connections for this episode, but next week we're going to talk about Season 2, Episode 6, Secrets. So many secrets. Very many secrets. So well. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.